Christmas cookie, though. <laughs> that was you, Darren? No. Oh, you want to find out too? Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's a conspiracy, Jared. <laughs> All right. Um, today, I'm, we're in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're in the fourth chapter, and we're going to be looking at verses 14 to 30. Uh, we're still in the, the season of Epiphany, and, and, and continuing things are being revealed to us. Uh, we, we, again, we, we hope that we, that we see a little more about God and a little more about Christ and hopefully maybe just a little bit more about um, you know, how we react to God. And unfortunately, like I was talking to the children, um, we don't always react the right way. So this is the story of the beginning of the Galilean ministry. Um, Jesus, of course, was born in Nazareth and he's gone back to Nazareth here He's gone out. Uh, this follows the, the, the baptism by John and, and him going out into the wilderness for 40 days and confronting, confronting Satan. And, and, and now, he, this is immediately after that, actually, and now he's, he's come back to, uh, to Nazareth. Though we, we, by, the, by the, the, the dialogue here, we, we have to understand there is apparently a little bit of a, a time lag here because he's done some things and, uh, you know, and the, the, his... His accomplishments have gotten back to the hometown. Um, it's estimated that that Nazareth at that time was probably just a little under 500 people. Um, so it's a small town, uh, a village. Um, probably most everybody, just like here in Lake City, probably most everybody's related to each other, uh, cousins or third cousins and, and whatnot. Um, so it is a tight community. So these people know Jesus uh, fairly well. And uh, he's going to the synagogue now, in, in, in Jewish tradition, if there's more than 10 uh, Jewish uh, individuals in the community, they, they needed to set up a synagogue. And a synagogue was, was not a place for sacrifices. That's what the temple was for. The synagogue was for learning and worship. So that this is what's going on. Uh, Jesus is going to the synagogue in Nazareth. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do here also in your own town the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow as Ephrathah in Sidon. In Sidon. There, were, there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. One of the things before I get started that we need to catch there, and I'm very much preaching to the choir on this cold day, and those of us that have, that have come to, to, uh, to worship this morning, uh, it says here that Jesus was going to the synagogues, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Even Jesus, the Son of God, needed to be in community with other believers. We need to remember that. 
Jesus needed to be there. He was needing to be there to teach, of course, but he's also there to recharge, just as we are. So let's take heart in that and realize that, that, that just as Jesus needed community, so we need community and community needs us. But what Jesus has done here is he's been handed the scroll of Isaiah and he's actually turned uh, to what is where we would find it today in the 61st chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah is normally believed to have been written by, by three different individuals. It's not just one, one person that's written this, and it's over a, a, a period of time. Now this portion of Isaiah that he's quoting or reading from um, is a part that would, that would be in what they consider the third part of Isaiah, or third Isaiah. And it was most likely written either right about the, the end of the exile, to Babylon, or it might have been written just after the exile. So it's it's about 500 years before the time of Christ that those, those verses were written. But it was written at a time where the people were being were either looking and seeing that they were about to be set, sent home, or they were on their way home, or they were were home. And what it's really uh, talking about uh, is the year of Jubilee. Uh, and the year of Jubilee um, is found in the book of Leviticus in the 25th chapter. What the ancient Israel had a tradition of every 50th year, there's a little bit discussion of whether it was the 49th year or the 50th year, um, uh, which year it was. There's not a real agreement among scholars on that, believe it or not. Uh, it's not something that was practiced in Jesus' time, though, but it was something that they were aware of. But they didn't practice it then because they didn't believe all the Jews were back into Israel. They don't practice it today because all the Jews are not back in Israel. And what the year of Jubilee was, is that was a year when no agricultural work was done and all the slaves were freed and all the debts were forgiven. And Theoretically, the land was given back to the original owner. So if you had sold your land, um, you, you would get it back in the year of Jubilee. You would go back to that family. So that's a, it's, that's a big deal in, the, in, in there. And, and so this, these verses in, in Isaiah are thought to be in reference to that, to that year of Jubilee. Um, and at first, these, these people in the, in the synagogue are very excited. You know, we oftentimes read this and we think, oh, they immediately are upset with Jesus. And I think it actually is worded that way in, in Mark or Matthew. But in Luke, um, their, their, their original response is, oh, you know, instead of saying, well, isn't this just the son of Joseph? It's like, this is, isn't this the son of Joseph? How did he get all this wonderful knowledge? And he had read this first part of Isaiah to them. And they immediately filled in the rest. He stopped short. That's one of the, the things that we have to realize. He stopped short. He stopped in what would be for us the very first part of the second verse of 61 Isaiah. There's 11 verses to that chapter. Not that there were chapters and verses in Jesus' time. It was just a, a scroll. The chapters and verses are, are, a, are a much more modern thing. There was nothing like that. But reading on in, in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the year of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the, joy, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness as planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities and have been, that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd their flocks. Foreigners will work their, their fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God who will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. 
For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign God will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Oftentimes when you stop short, people will fill in what they want, what they want to hear. Jesus stopped short. He stopped after that, that uh, verse of the year of the Lord's favor. And all the rest of that, the Israelites filled in, didn't they? And Jesus sat down and they all thought he was great because he's talking about the, 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 the basically the judgment day is coming and all of those people that, that, that used to be bad to us. And you have to remember when Jesus is talking, who are they blaming? It's not the Babylonians that they're looking looking for, for revenge against. Now it's it's the Romans, isn't it? The occupation. And for some of them, it would be the, the, the leadership in the temple as well. Uh, for some of them would have been looking towards that. So Jesus sits down and shuts up for a moment. And the reason he sits down is because the tradition was then that you read the scripture standing in each city. I'm not sure why we got away from that, Bill. You know, I need a stool up here. Uh, some pastors sit and preach, but I'd rather stand. Um, but at any rate, he stops. And they all love him. Oh, this is great. This is great. This is great. But then he goes on and talks, and he points out to them, but the people that are going to get the blessing are not going to be y'all. For like these other, the Elijah and Elisha, the people they came for were the Gentiles. They're not the Jewish people. Because, guess what? You guys have done, you've done bad. You've messed up. You haven't followed the Lord. And as I was talking with the children, we have, we have two responses when somebody tells us we messed up, don't we? Pretty much. I mean, there's probably some exceptions. But most of us feel, you know, you're like, when somebody tells you you've done wrong, your first reaction is, you know, depending on your personality, is either being contrite and embarrassed and apologetic, but for far too many, and it's getting worse and worse and worse every day, the first response from most people is anger. How dare you point out my sin? And such is the case here. They go from being excited when Jesus tells me, you know, you people, you don't even have the faith for me to do miracles here. I, I'm not going to help you. I've helped those other people, but I'm not going to help you because you don't have the faith in me. You don't really believe in me like you should. And so they go to throw him off the cliff. And of course, it's not Jesus' time yet. So... We can, we can try to explain away the, you know, the different things, but I think for whatever reason, Jesus' charisma, Jesus', Jesus presence, and they, 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 they let him walk, and he, and he leaves, and he doesn't go back to them. And that can kind of sometimes be the way, you know, I think God always follows us, but, but if we want to isolate ourselves from God, sometimes God's going to just let us be isolated from. In this world today, I think we have a, a real phenomena going on out there where too many people are angry when you identify their sin. We see that all over the place. And they lash out. And I think that's a, a big part of the reason why people are atheists, to be honest. They're angry at God either because they felt God should have done something for them, or they're angry because Scripture points out 
and shortcomings. Because as I've said so many times, if you never feel convicted when you're reading scripture, you're not reading close enough. Too many people would want to rewrite and rethink and rationalize to the point where their sin goes away. Or they want to say that your sin is greater than my sin. And so therefore, I know I sin, but your sin is more blatant. And as I said, so many times when we stop short, we let people, you know, people fill in the blank, don't they? And you'll notice that I did not identify any sins, did I? There's a reason for that. Because if I start rattling off sins that I'm preaching against from the pulpit, guess what y'all going to do? Say, oh, I'm good on that one. I'm good on that one. Judy's saying, yeah, I'm good on that one, right, Judy? Yeah, I'm good on that one. He didn't mention this one. But guess what? I don't have time, and you don't have the patience to sit here and let me start rattling off sins that we all commit of the various multitude of variations upon sin, even. I can't do that. Rather, I'm going to stop short because what you all have what each of us has to do is we have to reflect upon ourselves and we have to look at scripture and we have to be honest when we're reading scripture. Is that finger pointing back at me when I read this? Or am I reading through that part really fast because I know there's going to be a finger pointing at me there and I really don't want to see it. So I, I'm, I'm going to skip up through that part. I'm going to read really quick or I'm just going to jump that chapter. I know that chapter is a chapter I don't want to read so I'm going to turn the page and I'm going to read this chapter because I like that chapter. Because that chapter points finger at that guy I don't like over there. And I know his sin is right there, so I'm going to read that chapter. And we're going to skip the chapter where it's our sin. But that's not what Jesus wants us to do. Forget about that, that uh, speck in your neighbor's eye. Deal with that log in your own. When you read scripture, think about what it's saying to you. Is it condemning you? And then deal with it. Granted, I think we need to be, we need to try to convince people to read scripture and to really discern on scripture and to try to figure out whether they too are following it. But I don't really think it's my place to stand up here uh, and try to give you an exclusive or an inclusive list of all the sins. And today I'm afraid again, if I do that, you're going to focus on what I said and not what I didn't say. And I want you instead to focus on what I didn't say. What I didn't say was what sin you're guilty of, because only you know that. I know what sins I'm guilty of. I know what sins I have to deal with. I'd rather deal with them on this side of death than on the other. And I'd rather you all, you too. And I'd rather that all those folks that might be out there watching this on YouTube or on Facebook or watching it on YouTube later, I'd rather you deal with those sins on this side of the grave rather than on the other side. Because though I believe grace is, is eternal, and I believe God is filled with grace, I also believe there is judgment. And we don't want that judgment to be judgment that's in, inflicted on us on the other side. We want to deal with that, with that judgment here and now. And we can deal with that judgment by recognizing those sins and doing what I told the children to do. The other alternative, rather than getting angry, when God tells you you were bad, it is to, I'm sorry, I'll try to do better. I know I'll fall short, but I'll try my best. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please, please, uh, let us see fit to do our absolute best on this side of the grave, to, to do your will. And Lord, forgive us those times when we get angry because we, we recognize our shortcomings, we recognize when we, when we failed, and all of us do that, dear Lord, and I, I realize I'm probably the worst of, of all for that reaction. Lord, forgive us for that, for those moments. Lord, let us be softened, let our hearts be turned, that we might ask for your grace and your forgiveness in all of our sins. We pray all of this to you today in your glory. Amen.